Hi, welcome to the new Fly Fisher. My name's Bill Spicer and I'm your co-host. This week, Fly Fishing 101. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go through everything you need to do to fish a typical trout stream in North America. We'll discuss equipment, we'll discuss flies, we'll discuss some basic entomology, and we'll discuss reading of the water. You may want a pen and paper for this one. It's gonna be a great show, just chock full of information that you've been really looking for. So get ready to take notes and we'll be right back. That was awesome. These are extremely strong fish. There he goes. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, good fish, good fish. earlier about having the optimum condition. Here we've got a good example of the family Heptogeneidae, uh, very flat music, sweet music. This is why you need a lot of backing. The new fly fisher is made possible thanks to scientific anglers, makers of mastery series fly lines, sage performance fly rods, Loon Outdoor Products, fishing with a conscience. On today's show, we're fly fishing the Grand River in the town of Fergus, Ontario. The Grand River is ideal for fly fishers because it's blessed with numerous walk and wade angling and public access points. The prime waters to fish for brown trout exist between the Shan Dam at Bellwood Lake and the town of Westmont Rose, a total of over 28 kilometers of excellent river fishing. This picturesque town is known for its friendly people, quaint shops, and terrific bed and breakfasts. The Grand River has fast become one of the premier tailwater fisheries in North America. Joining me today is a good friend and mentor to many a fly fisher, Mr. Bill Christmas. A passionate fly fisher and conservationist, Bill is going to share some of his vast knowledge and experience fly fishing trout streams. The techniques he will share with us can be used on any other trout stream in the United States and Canada. Most of the water system is covered with no-kill zones and single barbless hook regulations. The net result of these prudent regulations is a world-class brown trout fishery. The first thing to do when approaching the stream is to stand back and look at the edge of the water. Often there is a feeding fish right against the bank. Many large fish are seen feeding within inches of the bank and to enter the stream right away would be a mistake. Okay, one of the first things we want to do when we get to the river have a look for insect life and we're going to take the temperature. This determines largely how soon the caddis flies are going to be on the water and also whether we're in the optimum range for feeding for trout. Wow, what a beautiful morning, 61 degrees. That means the caddis are going to be active and the trout are going to find this temperature perfect. It's going to be yeah, to their liking. we're just liking. about optimum for trout feeding, aren't we? Absolutely perfect. We're going to have a great day. Yeah, that's good. That's good. It's going to be great. Any new piece of water that you come to, you must find out what kind of insect activity you have. And what we're gonna do now is we have a, a netting here, it's called a seam. We're gonna put it in the water, Bill is gonna get above me here, kick some of the dirt up, and we're gonna see what kind of bug activity we have in the water. This will help us decide what flies to use. I think right about here, Bill. Now all you have to do is put the net in the water like so. Bill will get up a little bit ahead of me and just kick up some of the bottom. Turn over some of those stones. It doesn't take long. No. There's lots of activity in this river. Oh yeah, it looks like we got some. And I lift it up like so. Oh yeah, we got some bug activity here. I'll take them over. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Got a caddis pupa here, green with a dark head. Great pattern to tie, mm -hmm. though. Yeah. These are called isopods or crest bugs. Very pop, very, very, see how many of them are? That's an excellent food. You tie an isopod. We got a couple of small mayfly nymphs. These are very, very small. Yes, looks like they're and, we're gonna have to go tiny today. You have to go tiny when they're the major fly on the water. That's about it. There's a couple more over here. Look how active this guy is. Looks like very a little small. beta, yeah. But looks like another crest bug there. Yeah, another crest bug. Yeah, yeah we've got, uh, a fair mix, but we've already seen some excellent 
activity in the air as well. Yes, yes. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to match the size and the color of what we have in the net here. So this is basically all you need to do. It's no big rocket science here at all. Uh, you don't have to know the, the proper names to the flies. All you have to do is determine the size and the color. One of the first things you want to do when you first come to a, a trout stream is determine whether you have surface activity or not. Today I'm not seeing any surface activity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the bottom of the river. I'm going to use a nymph, which I have a generic nymph here with a piece of split shot. And way up on the other end here, I have a strike indicator. I'm going to try to get down to the bottom. That's the beginning. Now, as I see surface activity begin, then I'll change my rig up to either an emerger system or a dry fly. Now the, the spot I've chosen is two currents here. It's called the seam. You got fast water meeting slow water. And what that causes is a spot where the fish will lay where it's almost a void. It doesn't take a whole lot of energy for the fish to lay there. So this is where I'm going to place my fly along the seam, right along here. I'm going to try to dead drift it and follow along with the rod tip. It's important to keep the cast short and lift the line up off the water. Follow along with the rod tip at the same speed the indicator is traveling on the surface. It's as important to have a drag free drift when fishing a nymph as it is when fishing a dry fly. I think I might put a little more weight on here. I don't think I'm quite making it to the bottom fast enough. Use the minimum amount of split shot or weight to get your fly down. Too much and you will continuously hang up on the bottom, too little and you are out of the feeding zone. You must constantly adjust your weight and rig to match water conditions. This is fundamental when nymphing. If you don't hang up once in a while, you're not deep enough. You need to use minimum amount of line, keep as much off the water as possible and closely follow its path down river continuously mending and adjusting the drift to ensure your fly appears natural to the trout. Ooh, that was a fish. There we go. Fish on. Water visibility is generally good. It varies from clear with a slight greenish tinge to brownish and turbid when running high after heavy rainfall. Thankfully for anglers, if the waters are high and stained, these conditions do not last long as the system seems to quickly return to normal within a few days. Now what I did, folks, was I just followed along with the tip, and as soon as the indicator made a move, I set the hook. And <laughs> we have what's commonly called a bugle trout. It's a sucker. You know your fly is in the right zone if you start catching species such as suckers. Suckers will coexist with trout in the same lies and they will readily move to a nymph if given the opportunity. And he just took my fly on me. <laughs> well, <laughs> it wasn't the right species, but it's some action. It can save the day sometimes, them, them suckers. There are some basic principles for nymphing which all anglers should know. One of the primary concepts is the two to one rig which states that for every one foot of water, you should have two feet of line between your fly and the indicator. Thus, if you're fishing in four feet of water, the distance between your fly and the indicator should be at least eight feet. Of course, these are just guidelines. The key is adapting to conditions as you fish different stretches. Don't keep using the same setup in all situations. Anything that moves that indicator, whether the indicator slows down, sometimes you get lucky and it goes under the surface, sometimes it moves a little bit sideways, and sometimes it's just a, a feeling you got. Set the hook. It could be the rock on the bottom, but it could be the biggest fish of your life. You never know until you set the hook. Brown trout are one of the most hardy cold water fish, capable of withstanding fairly high temperatures. 
However, their optimum feeding range is between 54 and 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Water temperatures outside this range decreases the trout's metabolism and feeding activity. Fish on. Whoa, keep up, keep up. Ran at me a little bit there. Came on the reel. There we go. This feels like a good fish. Oh, and he let go. <laughs> well, let's check my fly and make sure. That was a good, that, that was a nice fight. And double check my hook. And my line, make sure I'm not frayed. Everything seems to be good. Let's try that again. That felt pretty good. While I was using nymphs further downstream, Bill has been upstream collecting some insects and has noticed some surface activity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change tactic, tactics now and we're going to go with more of a merger system and dry fly system. What Bill has done here though, he's re-seen the, the water and he's got some pretty interesting looking insects here and I'll let Bill explain. Well basically, Bill, this is a section of the river that tends towards small flies for some reason. A lot of fish here are caught very frequently mm -hmm. and I find that Tiny flies, 18s and 20s, yes. predominate, predominate their, their uh, food preference. And I think it's because they, they get caught so often with big flies with hooks in them, they gravitate to exactly. small flies. Exactly. So, so smaller is better than larger in, this section, in most it of the sections. To, right? Yeah, it seems yeah. to be that way. In mm -hmm. this section, however, uh, we've spotted one good fish that's obviously taking a caddis because yeah. he's a very splashy rise. He's right. moving a big bow weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got a couple of little precocious guys that are just hitting the surface. You hear one just there now? Yeah. Little bubble. He's taking these tiny flies. Yes. You can go nuts trying to yeah. catch those, yeah. but it's worth it. Uh, but it looks like we got some olives here. Now, some olives. olives are just, they're, they're olive in color, mm -hmm. and they're very tiny. You don't have to know the, the Latin name at all. We yep. just know size and color. That's all we're going for today. Yes. Anyway, there's a, a that's a that's a green caddis, see? Yeah, a green caddis right there. So we right could there. try a green and slate caddis a little bit yeah, later. That could well be the, the color yes. of the one that this guy's taking over here. Exactly, the yeah. All right. So right. we'll experiment a little bit. On that small olive, yep. yes. Yeah, I don't like this yellow colored fly at all. What I was doing, folks, Bill was telling me what he was doing over there and suggested I put on a smaller olive, and I had a rise right beside him, so I took a chance and cast it to him, and sure Bingo. enough, there he was. Bingo. All right, good fun. Now, the most prominent insect on the Grand River is the net building or filtering caddis. Thanks to an abundance of algae, spotted sedge, speckled sedge, and little black caddis are a prime source of food for brown trout. There we go, he's gone. Fish, Not a very good. big fish, but it's oh, the right species, one. a trout. Yep. Hopefully we can take some more of them and take some bigger ones, hopefully. Yep. Thanks for the advice, Bill. Hey, my pleasure. You learn a lot in the Catskills because the water is so clear. And we were in Barnhart's pool, and I got some good advice from a friend of mine who's a biologist, and he told me about the Cornuta fly. Anyway, it was all about emergers. And this particular day, the, the fish were taking emergers. There's a specific rise form that you can read as an emerger rise form. And these fish would not take a dry on the surface. They wouldn't take a nymph deep. They wouldn't take a nymph halfway up. You could see them all the time. And finally, when I raised the nymph up from the bottom, they tended to react. And uh, this was scientific, actually. We thought, well, what, how can we get, replicate what they're doing? They're looking at a fly coming to the surface and going downstream dead drift speed. And uh, we reasoned that uh, a floating fly pulled under might just do the trick. And uh, it wasn't easy. It took me almost three years of playing around with this. But when we perfected it, uh, on occasion, it produces fish when nothing else works. And, uh, the classic case was a day in the Catskills when we caught something like 17 fish in a morning and no one else was catching anything. And the word got out there was a couple up on the creek doing this. And when they found out we were in the Orvis shop uh, buying more tippet because we snapped a lot of fish off, they all wanted to know what fly we were using, but they didn't care how we used it. And 
they, weren't under, they didn't understand that it was pop it under and let it come back to the surface on its own buoyancy. And hopefully that's what we'll show you here today. Really the submerger method I think can only be done with the buoyant fly like the usual because it's made with snowshoe rabbit fur. It's very buoyant. You pull it under and it'll still come back to the surface many, many times after it's been drowned. And, and that seems to be the key, buoyant fly. So I, I really haven't had any success with any other method. And I don't eliminate the tail. Some people tie the snowshoe rabbit wing and leave the tail with conventional stuff. I find the tail's vital to bring that fly back up. Local anglers are a great source of information on everything from patterns that are working to recommendations of locations. Most are quite happy to share their knowledge with you. Of course, proper etiquette is always appropriate when approaching another angler's run. It is considered prudent and polite to ask if you can approach or join someone in the same section of water. Angling pressure on the Grand is generally moderate, especially if you consider the population base that exists in the region. However, if you want to enjoy the river in relative solitude, I recommend you visit the river during midweek as there are a few anglers on the system. The brown trout on the Grand River are generally strong and healthy thanks to a strong base of invertebrates ranging from stoneflies to massive caddis hatches. In addition, the Grand is blessed with numerous bait fish including dace, shiners, creek chub, suckers and sculpin. Leeches and crayfish are a common place providing another excellent source of nourishment for the trout. Browns of 16 to 18 inches are common and specimens of 26 inches are caught regularly. Very nice. Decent fish in anybody's mind. Very nice. What's the name of that fly? CDC Black Caddis. CDC Black, what size? 18. What an 18. Okay, what I was using was an olive caddis, and I was dead drifting it. I seen a fish come up a couple of times, and what I'm gonna to try to do here is get, get the line on the reel. I seen the fish come up a couple of times, and he looked at it twice, so I just kept persevering and putting it over him, and he finally come up and took it. Now, when a fish takes a dry fly, you must give it a second to turn around and move down with the, with the fly to set the hook. And I think we're gonna we're gonna net this one. Good fish. Okay. Yeah. How big was your caddis? And there we go. How big was the caddis, Phil? He took a little olive caddis. Yes. Small, eighteen. Uh, yeah, about an eighteen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an average fish in this area. Nice little brown. And that was on a small olive caddis. What I took that last fish on was one of these uh, olive caddis. Now this is about a 16, maybe an 18 long. Uh, we didn't see anything coming off that is large, so I decided to go smaller. And as soon as I went smaller, the fish came up three times to look at it and then finally took it on the fourth time. Uh, again, go smaller. If, if you don't see anything happening, go smaller. There are times when it's important to have a free floating or drag free drift. This can be obtained by using the men when the line lands on the water. Try and make the fly float at the same speed as the bubbles on top of the water. Uh, we were heading back for lunch. I saw a rise in the middle of that run up there. It looked like an obvious caddis rise, so I put on a, a size 16, my favorite fly, can caddis. First cast over him, bang, there he was. He's run me all the way down into the pool. He's a healthy fish, and I can't fight him hard because, again, I was on uh, 7x tippet for those small flies, so I'm, 
I'm playing them like a safe cracker to make sure I don't uh, snap this one off. I'm going to try and walk them over here into the quiet water if I can. While I keep the rod at right angles to the fish, that acts as a shock absorber so that he won't snap off that fine tippet. We got a chance to measure him on the net if we can before we uh, let him go. There he is. Looks like a healthy brown. I'm going to try and slowly walk him up the stream because he's taken me about 30 yards down from that run already. Up oh, there he is. I'm going to walk him towards shore if I possibly can. Interesting thing, if you keep this rod at right angles, every second motion of the fish moves towards you, so you can collect line on him every time he every time he swings his body. Here he is. Eh, not a bad fish. Not bad. I just want to get him up above me here. Oh yeah, it is a good fish. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Yeah, He'd probably run 15, maybe. We'll see. I'm. Oh. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have you. How about? You? I got a long leader on here, and I'm playing him on. Here, I got it. I got him. I got him. Yep. Ah, oh, missed him. Very good. Right. That's a nice fish. All right. Now you know what Very we're going to do. I think he's a little tired now. That's a nice fish. There we go. I'll put him in the net and get a rough idea, like this, how long he is. Yeah, he's about. Uh, I got him at 15 inches. Okay, that's good. Okay, let's, that's uh, let's remove the hook and now he's a barbless hook, so he'll, that should come out easily. And what I do is I turn him upside down, and then, then they don't struggle; they lose their equilibrium. There's the caddis fly right in the corner of his jaw, right there. There's an obstetrician here. There we go. No problem. Nice, healthy fish. Nice fish. Very good fish. No, thank you. Yeah, Stuck good. on my big ugly thumb. There we there go. We go. So there's the fly we took him on, and there's a nice, healthy brown. And he's going to like it because we're going to let him go right now. There you go. Very good. <laughs> well, Bill, hey. that was great. It's been a great day. <laughs> it's been a great day. You Thank know. you for being on the show. Welcome to my river. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, for more information on today's show and other shows we have, visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com. From all of us at The New Fly Fisher, thanks for joining us. Tight lines. We'll see you next week. The new fly fisher is made possible thanks to the Canadian Fly Fisher Magazine, Scientific Anglers, Mastering the Sport with Science, Islander Precision Reels,